hand over to our very first speaker. Uh, he grew up in Durban and moved to the Western Cape to study mechatronic engineering at Stellenbosch University. He hated it, so he studied some more, but this time uh, industrial engineering as a postgrad. Then he worked as a lecturer while finishing up his studies, moving through to Alan Gray in 2018. He works as a front-end developer in the advisor application team, and his name is Brian. And he's right over there, and he's walking over here. Give a big, warm round of applause. Very loud. Please let me know if it sounds funny or if you can't hear it. It's got that echoey noise. I'm sure the technician. So, yes, hi, I'm Brian from Fear. Uh, I work at Alan Gray, as Matt said. I'm not actually a tester, but uh, I do consider it a big privilege to speak here. Um, and I'd just like to share a bit about something that I'm not an expert in, but it is something that I'm interested in. And so, um, it's just an opinion, it's a bit of research, it's some of my thoughts some of my interests, and I'd love to engage with anyone who had interests as well afterwards, um, and tell you all about what I know, and hopefully learn a bit what, about what you know. So just to set the context, um, it sounds like it's going the whole time. We can turn it down, I'll speak loudly. Whoa. So just, I don't know how that sounds. Good? Yeah, I'm happy. Cool. So just to set the context, um, I lived in Stellenbosch last year, and I used to drive in and out to Allen Gray every single day, and that's on the waterfront for those of you who don't know. Now the 1st of June, I moved teams, so I started in January and I moved teams on the 1st of June. It was a new start and a new team, and I was going to be a front-end dev, and remember I didn't study software development, so I was, and probably by most standards, still have quite a terrible dev. So I was excited about this new move and the new space to learn in and everything felt cool. It was a Friday afternoon, I was driving home, obviously weekend means two days of no commuting, so I was really pumped about that. I was about 10 kilometers from home, if you know the road as well as I do from uh, Cape Town to Stonewash, I was on Bay Park Drive and I came up a blind rise and I was obviously going at about 100 because it was a highway and out of nowhere a guy ran into the road. And I slammed my brakes and I swerved, tried, tried to avoid him, he carried on running and I hit him. So I obviously pulled over and I got out of the car and dragged the guy out the road. And it was a sobering moment. I was there, excited, I was ready to start with my new phase and my new friends and my new life. And this happened. And it completely blew my world. It turned me upside down. So obviously I took a couple of days off, um, came to terms with what had happened. But the reality is, I had to get back on the road and I had to drive to Stellenbosch, from Stellenbosch, sorry, to Cape Town. The first of Jet, about 220 hours on the road, and about 12,000 kilometers to drive the same road every single day, where what I still consider the worst thing to have ever happened to me happened. Shortly after that, I was starting out in my new team. Out of the blue, I get a phone call from someone who I'd done some consulting work for back when I was still a student. And he said, I had no contact with him for maybe a year and a half, and he said, how's it? Just wanted to chat. I was wondering if we could interest you in a job. It's a consulting job, or you'd work for us, but you'd work remotely, so you can work from home. What's your salary? We'll better it. No driving, no corporate anything, and this just happened to me. So I thought, absolutely, I have to take this job. This is, this is it's a godsend, surely. Fortunately, I guess in retrospect, but at that time quite frustratingly, this guy happened to be quite high up in the business, he was very busy, so our communication was quite staggered. So I spoke to him and then a week and a half later he got back to me, and so it was quite slow. And during this time I had started out in this new team. So although when I first got the call and the suggestion of the job and we opened the conversation, I was absolutely convinced I was going to take this job. I thought, I can't do this driving thing anymore after what happened. By the time we eventually got around to the point where we said, cool, so what are you thinking? Are you going to commit? It was about a month and a half later. My mind had changed. I didn't want to leave anymore. In spite of what was a terrible drive every day, the anxiety that it caused me, all those things that any of you have had a terrible accident um, like that would know. In spite of all of that, I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to stop doing the drive because I wanted to work in Alan Gray, more specifically in the team that I was in. And then I started to ask myself the question, why? Why am I so interested in being in this team and sticking to part of this team? And so that's where my interest in this concept of team dynamic, of high performing teams and psychological safety came about. So the ideas that I had on it are not my own, I'm not a researcher in the field, 
but they're based on, I hate when people say they say, so I just wanted to put up front Amy Edmondson, if you're interested, she's a Harvard psychologist, Adam Grant is a Wharton psychologist or industrial psychologist, Simon Sinek is a public speaker and team strategist, and Google did a study called Project Aristotle. So those are my kind of frames of reference, and I'll happily pass on that afterwards if you'd like to read up more. But when I say they say, it is actually they, the people who do research, not just some wacky kind of thing that I heard on the radio. So what is psychological safety? I want to read you uh, actually what it's called, uh, what, what it's defined as. So Amy Edmondson, she co coined the phrase, it's a belief that no one will be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or for making mistakes. So in essence, it's building a deep sense of trust with the people that you work with. Okay, so what it is, is I made a mistake, I want to bring it up to, I want to tell people about it before it causes too much damage. It's this person is playing unfair or is being rude or disrespectful. It's calling him out and saying, I don't appreciate the way that you're treating me. Right? It's that soft skill that most IT people are like, oh, I hate the soft stuff. Well, I'm here to convince you, hopefully, that you are the soft stuff, so it's no point in you hating it. What psychological safety is not is everybody love everybody, we nice to each other, it doesn't matter if you make mistakes, anything goes here, yeah, we don't have any qualities. That, that's not psychological safety, that's terrible work culture that you shouldn't abide by. So this concept of psychological safety, we live in a knowledge economy these days. So it's now about what, how creative are you, what can you bring to the table, and how much do you know? We know this because it's a competitive work environment just to crack into, right? So we're in this knowledge economy the whole time, which means we're inherently competitive with one another. It's all about how much do you know, how much experience do you have, and that creates this uh, friction environment in the workplace. And, and we perpetuate that environment in our teams because we all want to be successful in our careers. So psychological safety is, is about creating a space where even though you want the best for yourself and I want the best for myself, we can both effectively coexist and actually we can work with each other to better our careers and ultimately to deliver as a team and as a business. And I think that that should be, I really hope so, at the core of uh, your job, your day-to-day -day job and what you want to achieve in, your, in the business that you work for. So like I said, a lot of people say, oh, I don't like the soft stuff, I'm not worried about this, you know, it's about lines of code. And, and, you're entitled to your opinion, but actually, at the end of the day, we are all people. I think we can agree with that. And psychological safety is not just restricted to work. It's also about your families. How safe do you feel when you challenge your father's opinion around the dinner table? Are you worried about what will be the, what, about how he will react? You know, now that you've grown up and left the house and you're not under his jurisdiction. I think some of us can associate with that. It's also about families, about relationships, about social circles, we don't want to say the wrong things, you don't want to stand out in a social circle. It's all the same concept because we are all the same people, we're just now in this organized environment that we call work. And so if it's entrenched in our DNA, then surely we can trace back as to why it's so important to us and why we kind of can't avoid it. And Simon Sinek does this really well and he mentions that all humans are kind of dri dri driven by effectively four chemicals. So the first one is endorphins, I think you're all familiar with that. That is the pain masking chemical. So when you exercise or when you do something, that ability to push through even though you're struggling, that's endorphins. And that's a huge benefit to us as humans because it lets us do more and more. In the work environment, no matter how tired you are, no matter how stressed you are, no matter how much else you have going on, you can keep going. When we were, let's just say, Paleolithic creatures, so way back in the day in the Iron Age, this is kind of how humans stayed alive because to track down a buck or something to eat, you can't really outrun it. You have to go and go and go. Days after days, hunters would track down a buck. Eventually, they would make the kill. Then they still had to drag the buck all the way home. So endorphins are kind of essential to our survival. That's the first chemical. The second one is dopamine, and this is the desire to achieve stuff. It's the goal, goal achieving chemical. So when you get something done, when you take something off your list, you feel great, you know that rush, you're like, yeah, got it done, put it to the side, next thing. That's dopamine flowing through your veins. Interestingly enough, you can artificially create dopamine by taking cocaine, for one, by having a smoke, for other, and by drinking alcohol. So it's, it becomes quite clear that dopamine is actually quite an addictive drug, and that's why some of those substances can be so dangerous. So that is how you artificially create this feeling of satisfaction, like you've got things done. Interestingly, social media has now kind of been added to that list, the desire to check your messages, to clear your emails, to get stuff done, to reply, to tick all the boxes. That's also considered a dope, an artificial dopamine rush. So we're all quite familiar with dopamine. Those are things that we call the uh, selfish chemicals, so they help us do stuff better. We get stuff done, we push through pain. 
Then you've got the self-list chemicals. The first one is serotonin. So if you had to buy, you've heard all of this before, but serotonin is, is the leadership chemical. It's the feeling that you get when you know that the people that you are dealing with respect you. So you feel like they appreciate who you are and it releases um, serotonin into your bloodstream. And similarly, by giving you that respect, people release serotonin into their own bloodstream. So that's how leadership, how leaders rise up and we provide sort of respect to them. They feel the serotonin, they become better leaders, they look hard for us. We feel serotonin, so it's like a self, it's a producing cycle and ultimately it, it boosts the team because it helps us do better as a group of people. Finally, oxytocin, that's what we call, for, no, for obvious reasons, the love chemical. So that's what released when you give someone a hug, or you can give a high five in a more professional context. Um, you can't create oxytocin artificially. So if I send you an email saying thanks so much for the great job, that doesn't release oxytocin in your bloodstream. It has to be physically one to one. So if I walk past you in the passage and I pat you on the back or I just say congrats on the fantastic job, that has the potential to release oxytocin. But you can't do it sitting elsewhere as a boss in a high up office. So it's a relational thing, it's a one on one thing. And those, so those are the self list chemicals, they help us do more and achieve more as a team. So a lot of people say, well, what's the best way to perform? Should I be look out for myself? Because if I don't look out for myself, I won't be any good, I won't be an asset. Or should I look out for other people? Because if I don't look out for other people, you know, it's the selfish thing, I'm only looking out for myself. Well, the truth is you kind of need to be both. Because all four of those chemicals that I just described, those are the core drivers of behavior in humans. Whether you like it or not, whether you're into the fluffy stuff or not, it's you and me. We feel that way, I'm sure at least one of those descriptions that I gave hits home when you think, hell, oh, I've felt that before. So in order to actually acknowledge that, we need to acknowledge that, it's, that they exist and we need to now engage with them. So how do we do that? Well, the one important concept that I want to uh, speak about is, is called the circle of safety and it's something that Simon Sinek speaks about. Back to this, uh, I like to think about man in its simplest form because we often think we're like super sophisticated and we've got it all together, but actually we're just the same people in a, in a different environment. And often our reactions are exactly the same, it's just a different things that affect us. So the Iron Age man lived alone out in, in who knows where, out in the wild. And there were all sorts of dangers. There's weather that could kill you, there are animals that could kill you. Um, it's kind of not a safe place to be in order to survive as a species. And you know you've got that intrinsic gear to want to survive. Gets you up every day, gets you going. So this man in, in whatever form he is realizes that actually you know what, if I partner up with you, we could kind of help each other. I could do the hunting while you prepare stuff, you, you, you prepare settlement. So you look out for me, I look out for you. And then we get another person involved and we say, listen, if you just watch for danger while we sleep, later on I'll watch for danger while you sleep. Because this will intrinsically benefit all of us because we will start to, uh, we will start to increase our chance of survival as this, this prehistoric man. Because remember, trust and cooperation, they're not directives. I can't say to you, trust me, and then you say, okay, cool, I trust you. That's not true. I can't say you two should cooperate right now. It doesn't work like that. It's something that you foster. So you decide to engage in this, and, and if I prove myself to you, then you will believe, okay, this person does have my best interest at heart, and next time you will reciprocate that, because that's how humans work. We reciprocate what we receive. So creating this circle of safety is no different today in the modern working world. Of course, we're not worried about getting killed by rogue animals or weather is perhaps not such a concern for us or where will our next meal come from. But we have different we have different things that concern us. The ever-moving tech industry, as we get older, there's more and more young people entering. Some people don't even need to study now and they can still threaten for our jobs. Or you have your business maybe struggling in the tough economy that we all know we're in. Who will be cut next? When will it come? How will it affect our paycheck? What about all the bills I have to pay? We have fears that are attacking us all the time, and it's actually a bit much for one person to take on. So when you're placed in a team, an effective leader actually gets the people together and, and, and says, I want to create a space where I look out for you, and I worry about how's our team doing? How, your job, how secure is your job? Are you getting fair remuneration? And you worry about doing what you do best, because that's really why you were hired. So you stop worrying about the corporate struggle and the fight and proving yourself and how good am I compared to how good is everyone else and do I get enough credit for my work? And you actually just focus on doing what you do best and someone else focuses on doing what they do best. The leader or the person who, who kind of heads up the group focuses on all those trying to control what he can in the outside, he or she can in the outside environment 
And so you build this circle of safety where people thrive. And you get this idea of reciprocation. You look out for me, so I look out for you. You've got my back, so I'm going to have your back. I'm going to do my bit to make sure that you succeed because you do the same for me. An example of, of where that maybe doesn't work is um, I'm married and my mother-in-law loves Pandora bracelets. And uh, so one Christmas I thought I'd really hit it out the park and I'd get a, the bracelet or, I don't know, the string. And then you buy the little things that you put on the string. Anyway. <laughs> I got one and I got a brown one and apparently the brown one wasn't the right one, she wanted the cream one. So I thought, well that's no problem, we just went back to the shop. I mean, it's like a stock keeping unit, it's literally designed to say you bought this at this shop, at this time, at this date, for this price. And we went there and said, hi there, can we stop this for a And she said, no, this way you can So I said, why? No, you, you bought it at this shop and based on these conditions you can't do it. So I said, this is ridiculous, you know, I've been around long enough to know that you definitely can find this on your system and you definitely can swap it out. And she said, sir, if I swap it out for you, I will be doing something I'm not allowed to do and I could get fired. That is a prime example of that boss does not care about the safety of that staff member. She has absolutely no jurisdiction to do a good job or her best job. Her only fear is, what do I do in order to protect myself so that at the end of the day, I don't get fired. I get my paycheck, I can look after myself, and I can fight my own fight. She doesn't care about doing a quality service, and I mean, whether or not we can swap a Pandora bracelet is maybe not the most world-changing example. But some of us are doing important work that requires you to actually give your best. And you cannot keep going back up the chain, back up the chain, back up the chain, and say, can I do this? Can I make this decision? Can I engage with the client that way? Can I put this piece of code into production to solve the problem? That's an example of a psychologically unsafe environment where you don't have the room to do your best. Google even did a study on this, and we seem to trust Google with all of our answers. They looked at hundreds of teams as they had, and the two main components that came out of that study, number one, is that high-performing teams speak in equal measure. That's an interesting one for me. So they don't have a dominant voice of reason, not even the leader of the team or the tech leader of the team. It might not be that in the same meetings everyone speaks in equal proportion, but over the course of time it sort of evens out, that there's a time for everyone to give their contribution to have their say and for their knowledge to be kind of imparted to the team. That was the first point. The second point is that the people in the high performing teams had the ability to intuitively pick up how the other people were feeling based on their nonverbal cues. Their body language, the kind of tone of their voice, the way that their eyes look, there's an interesting psychological test you can do online. It's a long running experiment where it's just pictures of people's eyes and you have to tell what emotion they're feeling. It's hella hard, but you should try it. So these two things, the, the, the balance of talking in the team and the ability to kind of intuitively feel what other people were, were thinking, those were the by far and away the best predictors of what teams were successful at Google, which I think we can consider as a pretty high performing tech company and a lot of people would like to work there one day. It didn't matter about qualification. It didn't matter about where you studied or how long you've been in the job. Nothing like that mattered. Those were the two primary factors. And it shouldn't really be a surprise to us because when it comes to building a relationship, what are the two things that matter most? If you go on a date with someone and they speak about themselves the entire date and then you pay the bill and leave, does that make you feel like you kind of shared a moment with them and you'd like to see them again? Maybe, but the next time you better talk, because if you do that a couple of times, you're going to get bored of it, right? We all know that kind of intuitively. And that second point about the ability to see when someone's upset, I think any of us that have been in any kind of relationship know that if you can't tell what the other person is thinking after a reasonable period of time, you're going to continually run into problems, and guys seem to struggle with that even more, or the most, at least. So these two, these two things that stood out at Google, ultimately what it came down to is that People don't want to arrive at work and become someone new. They don't want to put on this work face when they arrive and be someone at work. And then when they leave work, they can engage with the rest of their life because their life is messy. You know, stuff happens at home. As we say, shit happens. And that will come to work. It doesn't only reserve itself for the weekend. So we need to create a space where I, it's not an excuse. Like I said at the beginning, what psychological safety is not you treat me like a doormat and you just air your dirty laundry and I'll take it all and if you don't do your job that's okay because you're having a tough time. That's not a psychologically safe environment. It's acknowledging what headspace you're in, what you're struggling with and what you're carrying and I can meet you where you need me and I can support you because we're a team. You look out for me, I look out for you. That's the kind of environment that, well those are the kind of teams that out and out perform so much better at Google. 
So what does it mean for you? We're not at Google, we work at Cape Town based tech companies, most of us. Well, firstly, there's a business case for it. There's a company called Gallup. They're a management consulting firm and they did a survey firstly. Psychologically safe environments, productivity goes up by 12%, staff turnover goes down by 27%, and then we can sort of understand how that would work. And accidents and mistakes go down by 40%, which I think this was done in a more kind of manufacturing environment where we, we measure things by accidents and mistakes. I think you could look at it as bugs or production bugs, those kind of things in our space. It's interesting because I've read other research that said when you create a psychologically safe environment, accident count actually goes up. And when they dug deep into why does this happen, is it because you're, you're forgiving of me if I make a mistake, that people are kind of lax and they don't really mind if they make mistakes? Interestingly, it was never that there were more mistakes in a psychologically safe environment. It was that in a psychologically unsafe environment, people just hit mistakes. And I think that's true, right? When you discover that something is wrong, you try your best to cover it up as you can before it becomes a real thing. Is that the time that says stop, stop, stop? Okay. <laughs> There's a common saying that, that you might have heard is people say it's nothing personal, it's just business. Right? I think we've all heard that, you know, maybe maybe you've gotten laid off before. It's nothing personal, it's just business. Listen, if you are spending fifty hours of your week dedicated to a company, away from your families, away from your loved ones, not doing the things that, that you value in life necessarily, but working, it, it's bloody personal. That's a lot of your life. So we need to take it seriously, right? This is an important thing that I hope um, that I hope, at least if you haven't ever thought about it before, it starts to come to your attention. I think that um, the most important skills that we can do is that the first is to, to be open to being challenged. You can't enforce this on someone else if you're not willing to be challenged yourself because that's one of the key elements. And a nice way that, to think about it is think of conflict as a collaborator. Uh, so if we are not seeing eye to eye on something, then maybe there's a solution that could work best for both of us. Humans have this fight or flight tendency, and again, we, we can't avoid it, it's kind of inherent to us. If I threaten you, your brain is trained from a, from a biological perspective for your amygdala to shut down, so analytical reasoning and creativity go down, focus on stay alive. That's the fight or flight response. So when I challenge you on your idea, right when you need your brain the most, it literally abandons you because all of a sudden you're in preservation mode. So you're most inclined to actually just say, I agree because you're more senior than me, or you re revert to this kind of biological response. And that's true for all of us. I'm sure we've all been in a situation similar to that. Humans are also loss averse. So if I say to you, I'm going to flick a coin, if it lands on heads, I'll give you a thousand rand. How much would, how much would you be, sorry, if it lands on heads, you give me a thousand rand. How much would I have to give you in order to say, if it lands on tails, you can take that amount? Would it be a thousand rand? Who would be willing to take that bet right now? Probably not, because humans are loss averse. We would rather not lose than we would win. So when it comes to an argument about what solution is best, our loss aversion actually starts to come out pink. Because it's no longer about whether my idea is good. It's about, I don't want my idea to be proven wrong. So we start fighting about what we're not fighting about. We're actually just arguing because we don't want to lose. So as I draw to the end, Kind of, I didn't get to some of the, the, the tips, and if you want to chat more afterwards, uh, I think it would be great to. But where does this leave me? Well, I know that it's a, it's, it's a real thing, and uh, I came across the saying, blood is thicker than water. Does everyone know the saying, blood is thicker than water? And, and everyone assumes that it means that your family bonds are stronger than, than anything, you know, that stick together. Wrong. The actual quote is, the blood of the battle is thicker than the water of the womb. It means the exact opposite to what we think it means. It means that the people that you go through struggles with, that you fight with, that you commit with, and you share blood, sweat, and tears, those bonds are even stronger than the people that we call family. That's the real quote. And I feel like it's true. So why did I stay in Alingra? Why did I put myself through the torment for so long? Because I was building those bonds. I've built what I consider to be a circle of safety within my team. And it's not perfect, but it's there. And it's not the responsibility of the person who leads your team. It's not the responsibility of the product owner, in our case, or a tech lead, or someone else. It's a team effort. And my biggest concern is that we don't have champions for this concept. We come into a tech industry and we say, like, I really want to talk about team dynamic, about psychological safety, and we get yawns and rolling eyes. Well, I hope I've given you some inspiration tonight that you can't avoid it. It's part of who you are. It's part of our DNA. We are geared to think like this as human beings. Because at the end of the day, 
you will probably go on and have a really successful career. I hope so. All of us will get more senior, we will be leading teams, or we're doing more. And ultimately, you will require a lot from people who kind of report to you. That's the, you, you want to be in that position, right? So you're going to ask a lot of people. You're going to ask for them to commit their time, their blood, their sweat, their tears, all for what is essentially your vision. So when people come to them and they say, why do you do this? Why do you do this for Brian? Why are you working late? Why do you sometimes have to work on the weekends? You kind of want them to say, because I know that he would do it for me. That's what you want. But you, you can't achieve that synthetically. That's a real, very real feeling that requires input from your side too. And for me, that's the kind of team that I want to work in. So I hope I've inspired you. Um, I'd love to check more of the time that you're interested in. But that's what I've got for you tonight. Thanks. Short questions. Yes, Nadine, do you want to take us away? No. fostering something like psychological safety if it's not necessarily in the company culture and how do we get leadership on board to actually buy into that vision so that uh, it can kind of be from the top down. I would actually say, so psychological safety you can't do as a person alone and that's true for a team or a company. So if you're the only person flying the flag in your team, it's a hard slog. It, I believe it will eventually break through, but eventually everyone needs to be contributing to this idea because like I said, if I watch your back, I need to know you watch mine. So my first point is that I'm not so sure that it needs to come from the top down so much as it can bubble from the bottom up. And I never really even considered the thought of, um, you know, when, when I had this accident that pro prompted me to think about all of this, I never really thought, what does the CEO think, you know, what do the MDs think, what are the board of directors, how are they going to help me, why should I do this? I thought about, I need to get to work today, I need to make it through this drive, and I need to make it worth my while. And the only people who make it worth my while are the people who I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. So I believe that as an individual, start with your team, start engaging, I promise you, you will make waves. It, there, there's just no two ways about it. A high-performing team who's bonding together, things fall into place, like those stats say, I believe that's true. Uh, and, and that team starts to make waves, and, and the effect starts to spill. I think Corporate culture is shifting in general, so it used to be very stiff and it's like hours based and output based and things. So I think that it will catch up, but as an individual uh, in, in a company, you can really only start with your space and your people and start as a team. Get some buy, get people on board and start to spread the message. So you won't, you won't be the only person who feels that way. That's really the, the truth of it. So you think you're the only person because maybe people don't feel um, sort of comfortable enough to speak up. But if you put up your hand and you kind of take it, take it on your shoulders, 
you will see people start to get picked up along the way. That, that's really the only way. And, and hopefully, if you have a quality leadership structure, they know about these kind of things. It might not be front of mind, but they kind of need people to start at the bottom and, and let it to bubble up rather than for it to come to the top down. That's my best kind of advice. Thanks, Brian. Here's some more people. Oh! Wow! That's not wow. Thank you.